This is Boston Lanka News bringing you news, views and entertainment from Boston and USA. I'm Vayoni Dimel. For the special edition on UNHRC sessions in Geneva, we join with Dr. Dayan Jayatilakar, who is a political scientist, author and who served Sri Lanka as a diplomat. Dr. Jayatilakar, uh, you have gone on record saying uh, that Sri Lanka cannot win any international arena through a foreign policy strategy that is dictated by the Defence Ministry. Could you explain what you uh, mean by that? Yes, uh, I, I see a, a fundamental difference uh, between our foreign policy uh, as it was conducted during the war uh, in which uh, President Rajapaksa was the key driving force and our foreign policy in the post-war period. In fact, this parallels a change in our domestic policy as well in the post-war period. In the post-war period, we find a disproportionate influence in matters of policy of the defense bureaucracy or the security bureaucracy. Uh, it is uh, Sri Lanka has become uh, a, a bit more uh, like Pakistan before the civilian administration took over, where uh, the uh, defense authorities uh, imposed policy parameters on uh, the civilian uh, politicians and uh, the policy process. Now, this situation is very different from the one uh, in which uh, Lakshmi Kadrigama was uh, the, the main representative of Sri Lanka's external relations and foreign policy. Lakshman Kadrigama worked in a situation in which the uh, Deputy Minister of Defense, General Andrew Dratwate, was in fact a close relative of the then President Chandrika Bandaranaika Kumarutunga. And uh, Mr. Kadrigama was a member of the National Security Council. He used to be briefed by the Deputy Minister of Defense, but never did Lakshman Kadrigama take his cue on matters of policy from uh, the Deputy Minister of Defense. Uh, there was no role at all for the Ministry of Defense and the defense bureaucracy in the formulation of Sri Lanka's foreign policy and Sri Lanka's conversation with the world. Never did defense intrude into matters which had to do with Sri Lanka's relationship with other countries. But in the post-war period, we see many a public pronouncement on uh, matters which uh, pertain to Sri Lanka's external relations made by uh, the top uh, defense uh, official in the country. So uh, the foreign minister and, and his uh, predecessor have uh, not been uh, sufficiently autonomous to articulate Sri Lanka's foreign policy uh, in a manner that is not confined within the narrow vision and parameters of the defense bureaucracy. In any country, uh, the defense or security authorities view everything through the prism of security. And that's a very narrow way of looking at things. That is why uh, in almost no country do you have the foreign ministry being dictated to or uh, functioning as a ventriloquist dummy for uh, the defense bureaucracy. But in Sri Lanka, uh, this has been the case in the post-war period, and this has led to a tremendous uh, crisis because our uh, entire discourse, the discourse of Sri Lanka has changed, the profile and image of Sri Lanka in the world has changed, and Sri Lanka is unable to have a conversation uh, with the rest of the world, uh, chiefly the, uh, the democracies such as uh, the United States uh, and our neighbor, India. So uh, this is uh, a very serious uh, and unprecedented situation in Sri Lanka's post-independence history. It is leading us to uh, a dead end. On one hand, uh, you think that the resolution against Sri Lanka at the UNHRC session in March is unfair, while on the other hand, you blame the Sri Lankan government for not addressing issues uh, that allowed uh, such a resolution to come up. Um, could you talk a little bit about that? Yes, I, I think the resolution is completely wrong. It is uh, immoral, it is unjust, it is completely outrageous. Uh, this has not happened 
to any country in the world. Sri Lanka is a democracy. It is a legitimate state. It fought a war entirely within its own borders. It did not engage in cross-border operations. It was a civil war within Sri Lanka's borders. Uh, the war was fought against a separatist terrorist movement which behaved in a fascistic manner. Uh, and uh, Sri Lanka won that war. Now, in no other country in a similar context or situation or category do you have an international inquiry into the conduct of the war. Uh, not even in countries that were not democracies. I mean, let's look at the track record. Let's look at Latin America. It has taken 40 years for uh, inquiries to be held, and those are domestic inquiries, not international inquiries, into the conduct of military dictatorships that ruled uh, Brazil, uh, Uruguay, uh, that uh, ruled Guatemala, for instance. Now, it has taken 30, 40 years. There were no international inquiries. Uh, it has taken 40 years for an inquiry into atrocities committed in Bangladesh during Bangladesh's war of independence. There have been no inquiries whatsoever in Indonesia, which has moved uh, from military dictatorship to a very stable liberal democracy. Uh, one and a half million communists were killed in 1965, but there have been no uh, inquiries, to, uh, let alone international inquiries. The same is true of the Philippines, which had uh, the Marcos dictatorship and huge violations of uh, human rights. Now, the reason that there have been no such inquiries is that society takes time to heal. Uh, it has to carry the army along with it. There has to be a national consensus as to when it is right to look back at these issues. Let us take uh, Great Britain. Uh, what happened during uh, the, the civil war against the IRA? Bloody Sunday in London in 1972. Only civilian casualties, no fog of war. The British paratroopers were the only ones who were armed. It took 28 years and two inquiries for Britain to produce uh, a report. And nobody has gone to jail as a result of that. These are the countries which are asking us to have an international inquiry into a civil war against uh, a ferocious terrorist uh, militia. Uh, look at Spain, a liberal country, a member of NATO, a member of the European Union. It is illegal in Spain to inquire into even the casualty figures of the Spanish civil war that ended uh, a very renowned judge, Baltazar Garzon, who is associated with the doctrine of universal jurisdiction and uh, whom I admire because he tried to jail General Augusto Pinochet, uh, found that he was at the receiving end of a court case himself because he tried to inquire into the uh, civil war in his own country 75 years ago. Now, there are reasons that countries do not open themselves up to international inquiries and sometimes do not even have internal inquiries for a very long period. This is very unfair uh, for Sri Lanka to be subject to this kind of inquisition. But at the same time, why is Sri Lanka so vulnerable? In 2009 May, in Geneva, in the UNHRC, the, with the same Madam Navi Pille leading the charge, uh, the West tried to have a, a, a war crimes inquiry and Sri Lanka beat back that effort. Uh, Sri Lanka managed to get 29 votes with only 12 on the other side. Uh, but in the same Human Rights Council, uh, facing the same High Commissioner Navid Pillay, Sri Lanka is now at the receiving end. Uh, we've lost votes in 2012, 2013, and it looks like we are about to lose a vote in 2014 March. Now, this is entirely because of the uh, sins of omission and commission on the part of the government of Sri Lanka. It has mismanaged its relationship with the United States. It has mismanaged its relationship with neighboring India. And it has succeeded in losing the votes of those third world countries belonging to the non-aligned movement, which voted for us in 2009. I give you the example of Brazil, of Uruguay. Uh, so this has been a general collapse of Sri Lanka's standing 
in the world. And it is the government of Sri Lanka, or rather, those who are officially and unofficially responsible for formulating, managing, and uh, conducting Sri Lanka's external relations, who are responsible for the acutely vulnerable situation in which we find ourselves. Contact Colombo Express for all your shipping needs. Colombo Express. Last Sunday, Minister Vasudevanana Kar has said that the United States was using resolutions in the human rights body to force regime change. You think that's a fair assessment? Well, but yes and no. I mean, look, the United States can't do anything in the Human Rights Council unless it can win the vote. And it has to win a vote in a place where the majority comes from Asia, Pacific, Africa, and Latin America. So, you know, the, the fact of the matter is that if the U.S. wins, it's because we've lost. It's not so much that the U.S. has won, but that Sri Lanka has lost the vote. Uh, because even the United States, the world's sole superpower, has not been able to get against Sri Lanka the 29 votes Sri Lanka got in May 2009 in January. So, uh, you know, whatever the motivation of the United States, it's ours to lose. The game is ours to lose. It's a vote. Uh, they don't have a veto. They don't have uh, any uh, extra powers in the United Nations. I mean, in the Security Council, yes. But in the General Assembly, uh, you would know that every year, the Cubans bring a resolution against the United States on the issue of the uh, embargo of Cuba. And the last time, the Cubans got 188 votes in their favor, while the United States got only three votes. Uh, so it's, it's just not right to say that whatever the U.S. wants happens in the United Nations, even when it's against a small and poor country. This is just not true. Take Palestine. You also know that in... 2011, the uh, UNESCO recognized Palestine, and the United States uh, campaigned against it, it threatened to cut off funds to UNESCO, which it in fact did. Now, for Palestine to gain an entry into UNESCO, it required a two-thirds majority. I was uh, Sri Lanka's representative there at that time, so I was right in the middle of that uh, diplomatic battle. The Palestinians got more than two-thirds uh, in, in UNESCO, but despite the fact that uh, uh, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton lobbied personally, this, because elections were coming up in the United States, uh, and uh, APAC was campaigning very heavily on this. Uh, even President Obama got involved uh, to urge that uh, Palestine not be admitted to the UNESCO at that point in time, but he was lost. Palestine isn't even an independent country like Sri Lanka. Uh, it's the Palestinian Authority. So, this is a vote that Sri Lanka should be able to win, but it doesn't look like it's going. And, and that's uh, that's a weakness of the of the of the administration here. It's a pity. You led Sri Lanka in Geneva once. Then Minister Mahinda Samarasinghe led a few other times, and now government has chosen. Minister G. L. Pires to handle Geneva this time. Do you think Sri Lanka is in good hands in Geneva? Well, let's put it this way. Uh, behind the Samra Singh, uh, uh, there's always a minister who leads the delegation to the session. So, even when I was ambassador, Minister Samra Singh came in as the official head of the delegation. But I was Sri Lanka's ambassador per rep, and uh, again, you check the YouTube. Uh, I was front and center in that battle. I was Sri Lanka's point man uh, in the years 2007-2009, including during the special session. So, um, I think that Professor G. L. Pires is the best person to address the high-level segment of the uh, UNHRC, uh, which is supposed to do on the 5th of March. Uh, Britain and Canada are sending their foreign ministers who are going to push for the resolution against Sri Lanka. So they have to be matched. And 
Professor G. L. Pires is our foreign minister. Is also the uh, the most educated in cabinet. So he's the right person. You can't put Mahinda Samrasinghe against uh, the foreign ministers of Britain and uh, and Canada. I mean, not in the same intellectual or uh, academic class. But uh, I, I hope I hope that Professor Pires makes the best speech he can in the in of Sri Lanka uh, and its relations with the world, especially the Human Rights Council. He must not play to uh, what's wrong with the gallery back home. He must play to the balcony out there. Uh, Professor Pires can do it, but I'm wondering whether he will do it, because he usually uh, doesn't look so much at the international audience, but he's looking over his shoulder at the uh, the, the powers that be, and I don't necessarily mean only the president, uh, back here in, in Sri Lanka. Now, that's not the way Lakshman Kadrigama would have done it. Lakshman Kadrigama would have gone out there and he would have batted, he would have played a very impressive innings, an innings that uh, impressed the international audience. Uh, and he's, Kadrigama has addressed the UN Human Rights Council, by the way. So, that's the model that Professor Pires should adopt, and he can. Uh, Mind the summer thing, he couldn't even aspire to reach those heights. GL Pires can, but sometimes uh, he flies uh, much lower uh, than he should for domestic reasons. Uh, President Rajapaksa, uh, when he was in opposition, uh, went to Geneva, I think uh, that was in 1987 or 1988. He was among the leading political figures in the Mother's Front, which worked against disappearances during the then UNTP regime. Now, uh, those who go before HR Commission in Geneva are called as traitors. What is the difference between then and now? Well, I mean, frankly, if it was okay for Mr. Uh, for, at that time, um, Member Parliament. Uh, Mr. Mahindra Rajapaksa and uh, Mr. Vasudeva Nanakara to lobby in Geneva against the administration of President Premadasa, well, it should be okay for others to do the same against the administration of President Rajapaksa. So, uh, you know, there's that. And uh, it, it is hypocritical to, to, to label people when they do the same thing that you did when you were in their place. But I think there's something else going on here. It's um, it's, uh, it's it's an ethnic thing because the uh, the underlying assumption is, is it's okay if you go talk about Sinhalese, but if you talk about Tamils or the North, then somehow you're a traitor. Now I don't buy that. Uh, if it was uh, if it's treachery now, it was treachery then. If it wasn't treachery then, it's not treachery now. It may be wrong. I mean, I'm opposed to the resolution. I, I fought against it and kept it at bay uh, for a couple of years by uh, helping defeat it in 2009. I'm, 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 I'm opposed to it. But labeling people or parties as traitors simply because they did something that you tried to do in the late 80s but failed, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's illogical and that's unreasonable. And I must say that the government must think about what happened then. I was working with President Premadasa, as uh, many people know, during that time when uh, the opposition, Mr. Rajapaksa and Mr. Vasudeva Nanakara, went over to Geneva. And they were helped by my good friend, uh, later Sri Lanka's ambassador in Geneva, uh, Madam Tamara Kudanayam, who was a, a young activist uh, in Geneva on, 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 on that side of the, of the issue. They supported Mahindra Rajapaksa and Vasudev Ranakara. Now, at that time, Sri Lanka didn't have India's support because President Premadasa had asked the IPK to leave. And there were these uh, strong allegations on human rights. But he didn't face this kind of resolution. Now, how is that possible? That is possible because of the manner in which he managed our external relations. Who was the presidential advisor on international affairs at that time? Bradman Weirapur. 
who was uh, probably the most senior and certainly one of the most distinguished uh, civil servants that we had from the old elite Ceylon civil service. Today we have uh, Mr. Sajin Vaskunawadana, who I believe doesn't even have a, an a basic degree. So there's been a huge drop in the quality of the management of Sri Lanka's external relations. At that time, under President Premadasa, Sri Lanka's uh, ambassador to five European countries, which was spearheading the human rights campaign against Sri Lanka, was uh, Ambassador Neville Jayavira, again, a first class honors in philosophy from uh, the University of Ceylon under Saibu Jenny, and uh, a, a, again a top member of the Ceylon civil service. That was our representative handling these countries which were campaigning on the human rights issue. Who was our ambassador in the United Nations, uh, firstly in India and then the US, uh, in, in New York, uh, Professor Stanley Kalpagi. So that's how President Premadasa handled these same challenge. But uh, now, with the, the quality of our representation in, in sharp decline, we have been unable to do what the Premadasa administration did. And indeed, another example is uh, the problem that Sri Lanka faced when Madam Bandaranaike was uh, Prime Minister, and the United States viewed her government during the Cold War as left oriented. Now, people talk about Sri Lanka's present problem with the United States as being because the US thinks that Sri Lanka is too close to China. Well, the United States is competing with China in Asia, that we know. But it's not really a fully fledged Cold War. There was a real Cold War uh, after World War II and certainly in the 70s. And that was against the Soviet Union. And when Madam Mandarinaika was elected, it was said that she had the Communist Party linked to Moscow in her cabinet and her coalition. She had the Trotsky Lanka Samasamaja Party also in the cabinet of the coalition. And she had her own children and in laws who were radical leftists. So Washington viewed her with great suspicion and hostility. But in two years, in 1972, if I remember, Madam Bandaranaike was uh, a state guest, a guest of President Nixon in Washington, D.C. Now, how did that happen? Who made it happen? Not a lobbying firm. It was her choice as Sri Lanka's ambassador to Washington, D.C., Ambassador Neville Kanagarat. And by the way, he, he, he was not originally from the Sri Lankan Foreign Service, so it's nothing to do with foreign service professionals. He was from the Attorney General's Department, and then he worked in the United Nations uh, in the Congo, and then he was inducted into the Foreign Service. Uh, he was a brilliant intellectual. He was able to work uh, the Beltway and speak off the cuff. He wasn't talking about uh, Sri Lanka's ancient civilization and you know serving egg hoppers and putting on candy and dancing. He was convincing decision makers, intellectuals, think tanks in the United States, displaying a knowledge of U.S. history, of U.S. literature, and projecting Sri Lanka in a way that Washington's hostility to the Bandaranaike led center left administration evaporated. And it reached a point where the United States then sent Ambassador Chris Van Holland to Colombo, and uh, he had a very good uh, political and, and even personal equation with the uh, Prime Minister Salima Obaranaika. So we've been in a worse situation and we turned it around. And that's because we had the right kind of representation in the world's most important capital. Uh, Neville Kanagaratna was one of the most educated and literate ambassadors we had, probably uh, second only to uh, the iconic. Hamilton Shirley Amara Singer in New York. So that was the quality of Sri Lanka's representation. And the United States looks at Sri Lanka through the Sri Lankan representation in Washington, D.C. The U.S. asks itself, how do these guys treat the United States? Who have they sent here to represent Sri Lanka? What kind of guy? Where is he coming from? Neville Kanakaratna was able to turn it around. So these are among the reasons that we have. Uh, a crisis, almost a collapse 
in our equation with the United States. That concludes our news edition. We meet you again with another news edition of News, Views and Entertainment from Boston and USA. Till then, goodbye.